Good morning, everybody. Today is Wednesday, May 20th, and we have exactly, it looks like nine days left, actually, looks like 12 days left of class, actually a few more classes. Today we've got a reproductive system, we've got the next reproductive system is on Monday, and then on Wednesday, we've got another reproductive system, which we'll finish. So then we'll have an exam review. So um, let me go to the share screen. Hopefully you guys can hear me well. Let's see, crank this up a bit. Hmm. All right, so good morning again. The plans for this week and next and beyond um, are this. Today, we're going to be starting a new topic, the reproductive system. We'll be starting on the male reproductive system. Um, depending on how far we get, we will, um, if we don't finish all of it, we will finish it up on Monday, and then we'll start the female reproductive system. Um, depending again how far we get, if we, ha we haven't finished the female, we will finish that on Wednesday. Um, we will also have an exam review for the lecture exam. And just a reminder, just because of the uh, amount of material, it is going to be kind of a double exam. So instead of 25 or so questions, there's going to be closer to 40 or 50. Um, so double, double the points. Um, that's also the day that your extra credit is due. So if you're going to be doing that, um, analyzing the video, the cystic fibrosis or the COVID, that's when it would be due. Um, if you have any questions, definitely let me know. And then the following Monday is our last day of class, which is June 1st. Um, and we'll be having our lecture exam on that day, as well as the lab exam. All right, so let me go back here. Looks like we've got Caitlin and Go here. So good morning, everybody, all two of you. It's getting harder and harder to get up in the morning, I know. Good morning, sir. Good morning, how are you? We're doing great. Good, good. <laughs> we're doing great. Good, good. Yes, we're doing good too. Thanks for asking. All right, so let's go ahead and start the reproductive system. Um, and let me turn this up a bit. All right, so like I said, um, this is our final topic. Today we're going to start covering the male reproductive system, learn, ask, go over the aspects of the anatomy. Um, both at the gross level and at the microscopic level, we'll learn a bit about what goes on in the male reproductive system, obviously, uh, making sperm or spermatogenesis, and uh, we'll see how far we get on that. Whatever we don't finish, we'll continue on when, uh, next Monday. All right, so before I jump into the male reproductive system, um, I want to just to discuss something that's typical of both male and female reproductive systems, and that's the hormonal control. We didn't cover the endocrine system this semester. Um, those of you that are taking or will be taking um, the uh, human physiology, you will get a plethora of information on the endocrine system. But basically, the endocrine system consists of hormones that regulate a lot of different organs, obviously thyroid, adrenal, um, other organs as well, um, but included in that is the reproductive system. So as far as the hormones that are involved in reproduction, there are several. Um, starting off with the hypothalamus, that produces a hormone called GNRH. And GNRH is a hormone that 
when it's released, of course, hormones are released into the blood. This is a chemical that's released into the blood and then targets or reaches another organ known as the anterior pituitary. This is almost like a tag team or a relay because each hormone stimulates another organ to release another hormone, sort of like with batons. Once GNRH reaches the pituitary gland, which is, of course, on in the base of the brain, this is, remember, the uh, cella tersica, the sphenoid bone. The pituitary releases two hormones, FSH and LH. Again, this is occurring in both males and females. Um, in both males and females, they do similar things. Um, Number one, they are involved in stimulating gamete production. Gametes, of course, are eggs and sperm. So they, and the names for those functions are known as spermatogenesis, which is something we'll discuss today, and what's called, looks like oogenesis, but it's pronounced oogenesis. This is egg development. So these hormones stimulate egg development and sperm development, obviously, at the gonads, the testes, and the ovaries. In addition to having a role in sperm development and egg development, they also stimulate secretion of hormones from the gonads. Hormones that you might be familiar with, testosterone, estrogen, thing which we'll learn more, uh, we'll learn more next time as well, progesterone. Those are kind of the, the main hormones that we're looking at that are that. GLH and FSH stimulate the release of both of those, of all three of those. In addition, the hormones actually affect LH and FSH, also affect gonad structure. Gonads undergo developmental change, obviously, between fetal development and birth. Puberty, there's changes. Also, in female reproduction, changes that occur throughout the menstrual cycle changes that occur during pregnancy and lactation. So these are all undergoes, these are all involve structural changes of the actual gonads. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on that just to kind of give you a little background as far as how everything in our reproductive organs is controlled. Now if we were to take all the reprodu both reproductive organs of, of, of males, the males and females, we could say that we have primary sex organs and accessory sex organs. In males, the primary are the testes. In the female, they're the ovaries. We also have accessory organs, um, things like, and we'll learn more about these. In males, there's things like the prostate gland. Um, females, there's the clitoris other organs as well that aren't the actual primary organ where the gametes are produced. But these accessory glands are important. Much like, remember we spoke about accessory organs in the digestive tract, right? Where we have the, the, the main organs, mean, we'll talk about the oral cavity, the esophagus, the stomach. Um, but then we also spoke about the assess accessory glands like the liver, the gallbladder, the salivary glands that contribute to the function of digestion. These accessory glands here contribute to um, reproduction. All right, so today's focus and possibly also on Monday's focus is going to be on male reproduction. This is a sagittal view of the male reproductive tract. And what we're going to look at, we're not going to look at every, every single aspect, but we're going to look at most of the major organs. And I want to start it off by focusing on the testes. The, the testes are the site for spermatogenesis. And again, this is something we'll cover throughout this lecture. This is where spermatogenesis takes place. Once spermatogenesis takes place, the sperm, now mature, leave the testes and they travel through this organ known as the epididymis. And you can see right here. This is where sperm undergo a lot of transport, transport and development once they're made here. 
From the epididymis, the sperm then traveled down this long tube, which has two names. It's either called the vas deferens or the ductus deferens. Vas deferens might be familiar to you if you've ever heard the term vasectomy um, as a, as a um, contraceptive method. This tube, the vas deferens, is cut, which prevents the sperm from reaching the penis and from being ejaculated. You can see right here, obviously, general knowledge that the testes are located outside the pelvic cavity in contrast to the ovaries, and the female are located within the um, pelvic cavity. So sperm is transported from out of the pelvic cavity into the pelvic cavity through the vas deferens. And as it reaches the pelvic cavity, it encounters a series of these accessory glands. And there are three of these. We'll learn more about them as we go. We have what's known as the seminal vesicle. That's the one that's countered first. Then we have the prostate gland. This is followed by the bulbourethral gland. And these all add a variety of different um, components to the sperm um, as far as components that will provide energy, uh, motility, lubrication, things like that. Once the sperm pass through the prostate gland on the way to the bulbourethral, they pass through a structure called the ejaculatory duct. You can see this right here. Eventually reaching the urethra. This is all the urethra. The urethra is very long. It extends from the prostate all the way out through the penis, which is uh, this structure. Each of these different organs has a characteristic structure and function, and we'll take a look at these as we go along. But I just wanted to kind of give you the, the um, steps or the, the organs that are involved, beginning with the testes, the epididymis, as you can see here, the vas deferens, the accessory glands, ejaculatory duct, urethra, out through the penis. All right. Now, the testes, of course, are contained within a skin structure known as the scrotum, which surrounds the testes. So this is what we're looking at right here. Now, the, the, the function of the scrotum and the location is very important. The fact that the testes are located outside the pelvic cavity allows them to be thermoregulated to be two degrees cooler than the rest of the body. So what does that mean? That means that these testes are two to th three degrees cooler. Why is that? The purpose is that sperm development is optimal at a lower temperature. If it's at a normal body temperature, sperm development is impaired. At a cooler temperature, it's greatly accelerated. So, and of course, there's other structures associated with this. We'll take a look at with all these blood vessels and all the, also this musculature called the cremaster muscle. All right. So this is just kind of an overview of the scrotum once again, but also the important structures that play a role in thermoregulation of this organ. We have an arterial supply, which is known as the testicular artery. When you were studying that in lab, you may have known it as the gonadal artery, right? That was just gonadal artery. It's the same thing as testicular in males and the ovarian in females. This is what supplies um, oxygen-rich blood to the testes. We have the pampiniform plexus, which is a very long name. Um, which is a vein that drains the testes. These two vessels and the organization of them allows, as we'll see in a little bit, heat to be transferred from the arteries to the veins before they reach the testes so that the testes are a little bit cooler. All right, so those are very important for 
thermoregulation. In addition to that, we also have the cremaster muscle, which is a muscle just like any other muscle. It contracts and relaxes and can adjust the position of the testes depending upon the environmental temperature. So those are the three main structures involved in thermoregulation. I also wanted to point out a structure known as the spermatic cord, which is just a general name for this, this uh, for several structures that are sort of surrounded by connective tissue. Within the spermatic cord, we have the vas deferens, which is of course carrying sperm into the pelvic cavity. We have the pampiniform plexus and the testicular artery. And we also have nerves, and the nerves that are innervating the testes are autonomic, so sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons. They're all contained with, within what's called the spermatic cord. All right, and this is basically just reiterating what I said. The arterial supply to the testes are the testicular arteries. The veins that drain them are the pampiniform plexus. Those vessels help to keep it cool. And then, of course, we've got the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions of the ANS. And we'll see how they play a role, how they um, affect testicular and reproductive function. All right. I wanted to expand a bit on thermoregulation and maybe sort of clarify some things. Um, I mentioned, of course, that the testes are maintained at two to three degrees cooler. And this is due to the cremaster muscle, which adjusts the position of the testes, and also the vascularization. Well, just to kind of give you an, an idea of how this vascularization works, assume the testes are down here. Here's an artery, this testicular artery is supplying the testes with oxygen-rich blood. And here's the pampiniform plexus, which is draining it. Well, just by the close proximity of these vessels, and because the pampiniform plexus is kind of this web-like vessel that surrounds the artery, the heat from the artery is transferred to the vein. So this allows the blood reaching the testes to be a couple of degrees cooler. You can see right here from 37 to about 35. And as a result, the blood leaving the testes or in this area is now warmer. It's going back into the interior of the body. Okay, so that's basically how it works. This is what we call a countercurrent heat exchanger, um, which is very prominent in a variety of different systems, mostly in animals. Um, there's countercurrent heat exchangers in the brain and the extremities to help prevent animals from their paws from freezing in, in the snow. All right. All right. So like I said, we're taking a look at the male reproductive structures. First structure, of course, is the testes followed by the epididymis and so on. Um, I like this frontal view because it really gives you a kind of a perspective on where things are, everything from the accessory glands to the prostate, bubble urethral, penis, and other structures. All right, so let's take a, a in-depth overview of the uh, testes. This is the gross anatomy of the testes, and obviously here it is, there's the blood vessels. Um, one of the things that you can see clearly with the testes is that inside, so this is the, when it isn't cut into, this is inside, we have a lot of these coiled tubes, a lot of coiling. These coiled tubes are known as seminiferous tubules. You're going to hear me mention a lot of that because these seminiferous tubules are the site for spermatogenesis. This is where the developing sperm cells are found. And this is an actual um, testes from a cadaver. You can see the testes, the epididymis, and some of the other structures as well. All 
All right, so let's take a closer look at the microscopic view of the testes. So we know the testes, inside the testes, I spoke about seminiferous tubules, which make up the bulk of the organ. Um, they're made up of what we call spermatogenic cells. These are immature sperm cells that are eventually going to become mature. We also have another cell in there called the Sertoli cell. And the Sertoli cell um, is also has a very important function. Now, both cells are important. The spermatogenic cells develop into sperm. The Sertoli cells are kind of like a nursing, nurturing cell. These are the cells that protect, um, so provide nutrients, um, just kind of protect the sperm cells while they're undergoing development. Now, I had mentioned two main pituitary hormones target the testes. I mentioned FSH and LH. Um, FSH, being a hormone, has a particular target, and its target is the Sertoli cells. So from the pituitary, this hormone goes to the Sertoli cells, which helps to stimulate it in enhancing, maintaining spermatogenesis. In between the seminiferous tubules, so this is actually a tubule, this is a tubule, we have this area which would be the, which we call the interstitial region. And in here, it would probably be like in between there, not in between there, not where the tubules are. Inside this interstitial tissue, we have two main cells. Um, one you can see a little better than the other. Most of these cells you see right here. These are Leydig cells. Leydig cells, their main function in life is to produce testosterone. And they produce it in response to LH. So FSH stimulates the Sertoli cells to enhance spermatogenesis. Um, FSH does that. LH uh, targets the Leydig cells to stimulate testosterone production. We have other cells up here. This almost looks like a layer. These are smooth muscles type cells. We call them myoid cells. And these, these stimulate contraction of the seminiferous tubules, which are important in terms of eventually expelling the sperm from the testes as well, as, as well out, so they eventually get out into the epididymis. So it's like a muscular cell. All right, so this is the, really the big picture. This is what you're looking at. If you were to look under the microscope, take a slice of the testes, you would see several of these ringed structures. This is all a seminiferous tubule. In between these, here's another one, ring structure. Here's another ring structure. In between these structures, we have this interstitial region where we have Leydig cells. We also have these myoid cells, which are these smooth muscle cells. Inside the seminiferous tubule, tubule, most of what you see are spermatogenic cells that are eventually developing into the mature sperm. But we also have, and it's really hard to differentiate on this picture, but we have these Sertoli cells that are intermingled with them. So a lot going on in the testes. All right. So I've mentioned spermatogenic cells. I mean, that's kind of a very general term. All it means is that sperm are sperm cells that are developing. Well, when we take a look at the developing sperm cells, one of the things that we know is that these developing sperm cells undergo cell division. They multiply, divide, they undergo changes before they come, become mature sperm. On average, there's about 400 million sperm that are formed per day in males. There it begins at puberty, which is different from females in the sense that egg development, interestingly, starts to occurring in female fetuses. So when a girl is still inside her mother, her ovaries are starting to develop. Um, the ovulation, of course, doesn't occur until 
puberty, early or late teens, but um, the actual egg development begins early, whereas males, it begins at puberty. It takes about 75 days for an immature sperm cell to become a mature sperm cell. Now, as they start, well, first of all, let me just talk about the different types of sperm cells. Um, if you take a look at this picture, and I like it because it's color-coded, Let's take a look on the outside of the seminiferous tubule. So this is the outside. Let me go back just to kind of, so what we're, oops, what we're looking at is this area right around there. This is the lumen. This is the basal area or the outside. So here's the basal area. This is the lumen. On the edge, we have these, what are called spermatogonia. These are really the stem cells of male reproduction. As spermatogenesis begins, the spermatogonium become what are called primary spermatocytes. And this is through cell division. We'll talk about that a little bit later. These primary spermatocytes then also undergo cell division to become secondary spermatocytes. Secondary spermatocytes undergo one more round of division to become spermatids. And spermatids then don't undergo any more cell division, but they just differentiate into spermatozoa, these small structures with the tail, which everyone is familiar with the appearance of those. And you notice they're all in the lumen. These are eventually going to be released and work their way to the epididymis. All right, so those are the different spermat spermatogenic cells beginning with spermatogonia and beyond, and we'll take a look at the process of spermatogenesis shortly. Um, an equally important cell is the Sertoli cell, and here's one that's kind of outlined. It looks kind of like squished, but they're scattered throughout the seminiferous tubule. This again is the basal layer. These are spermatogonium. This would be the lumen. What do we know about the Sertoli cells? Well, first of all, they, blood vessels are out here. The Sertoli cells help to transport nutrients to the developing sperm. They help to protect the sperm from the immune system, which I'll speak about shortly. Um, much like we have the blood-brain barrier, we also have what's called the blood-testes barrier, which is equally important. As the sperm um, differentiate or divide from spermatogonium into uh, spermatozoa, you notice obviously they look different, right? You don't have the cytoplasm, it's just a compact nucleus and we have a tail. So one of the things that's helpful in that transformation of the spermatogonium and spermatocytes into the spermatozoa is the fact that these Sertoli cells will phagocytize the sperm the cytoplasm of the sperm. The sperm become much more aerodynamic and have much more motility without that cytoplasm. All right, so let's talk. That's one aspect of the Sertoli cells. I do want to mention a bit more, and some of this will be repetitive, some of it will be in addition. Um, like I mentioned, Sertoli cells play an important role in the support, protection, and nutrition of the sperm, developing sperm. Um, the Sertoli cells also supply or provide what's known as the blood testes barrier. And what, if you think about the blood testes barrier that's in the brain, right, it restricts what can leave the blood vessels and go into the brain. It inhibits large molecules, it inhibits potential toxins, things like that to allow the brain to sort of carry out its function without a lot of fluctuating conditions around it. Same thing is true with the testes. However, there's an additional component is one of the things is that the testes, I should say the developing sperm are seen as a foreign cell to our immune system. Because they look so different, structurally, developmentally different, 
if our immune system were to see the test the sperm, it would destroy them. So having this blood testes barrier um, helps to protect the sperm from the immune system, but also, of course, with the other function of the Sertoli cells, it allows nutrients to go across to the sperm. It allows waste to be released from the, from the sperm to go the other way. And it also protects, protects from the immune system. So if someone gets injured in the groin area such that the barrier is broken, that person could become sterile because the immune system would attack the sperm. Um, besides that very important function, um, the Sertoli cells also produce a couple different substances. Um, they produce, besides the nutrients, they produce a protein called ABP or androgen binding protein. This is a protein that helps to bind to testosterone that is being released from the Leydig cells. So if you remember the Leydig cells are out here, they produce testosterone and they've got a, the testosterone gets across here to help stimulate the developing sperm. Well, in order for it to accumulate in here, we have this ABP protein that helps to basically hook onto it and pull it in to concentrate it. So ABP is important, and you can kind of see it right here. Here's testosterone from the Leydig cell coming in, and here's the ABP, which helps to concentrate it. Um, Sertoli cells also produce two hormones, inhibin and activin, and they do two things. They inhibit FSH, hence the name inhibin, and stimulate FSH or activin. Um, we won't have time to get into all the significance of that, but it's a feedback regulation <coughs> that controls FSH from the testes. And lastly, phagocytosis, right? Destroying or removing the cytoplasm. So Sertoli cells are really multifunctional. Um, this is the blood, the blood testes barrier. This is the lumen up here. These are the developing sperm cells from spermatogonia to spermatozoa. What you see outlined in brown is a Sertoli cell. And they, of course, create this blood testes barrier, this physical barrier that prevents passage of not only cytotoxic agents into the seminiferous tubules, things that could damage the cells, but also just protects from the immune system, which would recognize the developing sperm as foreign. All right, and of course we know the other cells, the myoid cells which contract, and the interstitial cells, that's just another name, I should have changed that, that another name for that is the Leydig cell. That's just exactly the same thing. So that's just kind of a review. All right, so we know what the structure is of the seminiferous tubules. We know that they are made up mostly of spermatogenic cells that are going to become sperm. We know there's Sertoli cells and Leydig cells that are important there as well as myoid cells. But let's take a look at actually the process of spermatogenesis, what it involves, and basically how the cells change. So first, let's take a look at what we know. We know the different cell types. We know we have spermatogonia. We know we have primary spermatocytes, secondary spermatocytes, spermatids, and spermatozoa. And there we have them there. We have, this is a, a spermatogonia, what they're calling a geminal cell or a germinal cell. It's basically the same thing as a stem cell or spermatogonia. This undergoes cell division to become a primary spermatocyte. We'll talk a little bit about that division. It's mitosis. Once the primary spermatocyte is formed, it undergoes two rounds of meiosis. The first round of meiosis forms what are known as the secondary spermatocytes. The second round of meiosis forms the spermatids. And then the last step, which is, does not involve any cell division whatsoever, it just undergoes morphological changes, is the formation of spermatozoa. 
So I'm gonna show you a quick little video and then we'll move on from that. Let me make sure hopefully this will work. And you just never know. Let me just go back for a second here. Oh, why is it blocked? Oh my goodness, let's see, hold on a second. Oh crap, well, excuse me. Well, I'll get it fixed. Uh, for some reason it's blocking it on here. So I will go back to that another time and I'll, I'll see if I can get it fixed so I can send it to you guys. Um, we'll, let's just go back to, I do have that spermatogenesis that's shown on these slides anyway. So this is the process of spermatogenesis. And like I mentioned, we start off with the spermatogonium. And the spermatogonium undergo mitosis. And this is a really interesting step. You can imagine if all the spermatogonium underwent cell division to make sper spermatocytes and so on, um, we'd eventually deplete all the spermatogonia. Eventually, they'd be gone, right? So when, when mitosis occurs, there's two types of, of results from the mitosis. Number one, the, the stem cell spermatogonium will form what are called cell type A. And these continue to replenish the stem cells. Cell type A, it's like a replenishment to ensure we have plenty of spermatogonium up here. We also undergo develop, uh, cell division, which forms cell type B, which are the spermatogonium that are going to form primary spermatocytes. So we either form more spermatogonium or we form spermatocytes. And the ones that form spermatocytes are the cell type B, the ones that form more spermatogonium are cell type A. So let's go with cell type B for now. Cell type B undergoes mitosis to form primary spermatocyte. Um, and as I mentioned before, meiosis one forms two secondary, uh, secondary spermatocytes. Then we have four spermatids. And then those spermatids don't undergo any more division. They just differentiate into sperm cells what are known as spermatozoa. That's actually the correct term for the mature sperm cell. The whole process is known as spermatogenesis, but the last step between spermatids and spermatozoa is known as spermiogenesis. So what ha happens in spermiogenesis? Well, if you take a look, a spermatid looks just like this, let's go back for a second. Spermatid just looks like a normal cell. How do we go from here to a normal, from a normal looking cell to a completely different looking cell? Well, several steps have to occur. Um, first of all, as I mentioned before, the Sertoli cells will phagocytize the cytoplasm. So we lose the cytoplasm and all, all that's left is this nucleus, which is called the head, right? Um, we have what's known as the midpiece. And what's interesting, I mentioned that the entire cy uh, cytoplasm is phagocytose. There's one area that's left, and that is the, the mitochondria, which form the midpiece. So what you're looking at right here, this is just the mitochondria. This is the nucleus, this light blue. This area is the mitochondria, which is really the motor that drives the movement of this right here, which is the tail. This is the, really the flagellum. So this is the tail or the flagellum. This is the midpiece, which is the mitochondria. This is the head, which is the nucleus. And this dark blue area on top is the acrosome. And we're going to learn a bit more about the acrosome next time. It plays a very important role in fertilization. 
All right, and you can see there's four main phases of spermiogenesis, that last step. All right, and this is just another view of it. I just wanted to, so you guys can get a nice little visual. You can see going from this cell, and you can see all those mitochondria eventually will aggregate and cluster, right? Which and which eventually form this motor, which is right there. And then there's the head, the acrosome, and the tail. All right. So to summarize a little bit, spermatogenesis begins at puberty. Um, it allows for, and we didn't talk about this, but it allows for reduction in chromosome number. Um, most normal cells, diploid cells in our body have 46, actually they all do, except with the reproductive cells, they eventually have half that much, which is important because thereby half the number, which is 23, combined with, see if an egg is fertilized, that's 23, that will make a complete um, 46 or diploid. Um, mitotic divisions allow for the formation of initially type A or type B spermatogonia. The type B spermatogonia start to become the spermatocytes and the spermatids. The type A just remain in that stem cell state to just make more of those stem cells. And once we reach spermatids, then the last step is spermiogenesis, where there's a morphological change of spermatids into the mature sperm. All right, this is just another picture I wanted to show you to you can get kind of an up close picture of a spermatozoa. Um, the head I mentioned is DNA. I mean, so that's where all the, all the information is that's going to be, if an egg is fertilized, that's going to be delivered to the egg to provide instructions, which will combine along with the female, the, the um, egg DNA. The acrosome contains actual digestive enzymes that help in the um, penetration of the egg. The midpiece contain mitochondria, and then the tail is flagella. All right, Let's see how we do in here. Oh, doing good. All right, so the spermatozoa are formed in the testes, right? Um, in the seminiferous tubules. But eventually they have to leave, right? And they eventually, as I mentioned, make their way to the epididymis. And this is the epididymis, and this is the ductus deferens. And eventually that will carry it all the way into the pelvic cavity. But en route from the seminiferous tubules into the epididymis, we've got a couple other tubules for the sperm to pass through. Excuse me. From the seminiferous tubules, sperm first enter what's called the reet testes. This is kind of a network of tubes, which eventually drains into the efferent ductules. And from the efferent ductules, the sperm then enter into the epididymis. And then from the epididymis, the, as you can see, the sperm will continue on into the ductus deferens, which you can't see, but there's that spermatic cord, right? There's the vessels. This is going to be become the ductus deferens. All right. So why do, what's so special? Why do we have these specialized structures? You know, the epididymis, why do we have, is there some significance of it? Because we know the sperm are made in the, in the seminiferous tubules, in the testes, right? And they pass through the reet and the efferent ducts. Is there anything going on in here? Well, in fact, there is. Even though the sperm are made in the seminiferous tubules, um, they're not ready to fertilize an egg. They might look like they're ready, they might swim, but they're not mature yet. They need to undergo much more biochemical maturity. Um, their motility needs to improve to fertilize an egg. And this is where a lot of this occurs in the epididymis. And this is where the sperm are actually stored prior to ejaculation. Let's 
So sperm are made here in the um, test testes and the seminiferous tubules. Sperm undergo more like development. Um, they're already made, but they just undergo undergo a little bit more maturity in the epididymis, and they're stored here. And there's our vas deferens. All right. So here's the epididymis, and you can see it's also coiled, very coiled structure, much like the testes. Um, because we talk a lot about histology in this class, um, these the cells in here are pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Um, they're not ciliated. They have what are called stereocilia, which is just a lot of microvilli. So this is one of those areas, one of the very few areas where we find pseudostratified non-ciliated columnar um, because stereocilia are not true cilia. They're just microvilli. All right, what about the vas deferens? So now we're gonna go undergo another change. So the sperm are now mature. They're swimming faster, right? They're ready for prime time, whatever. Um, the, the vas deferens is a very muscular tissue. So now we are like right up here. It's not coiled anymore, really. It's a bit more straight. Um, here we still have the pseudostratified columnar epithelium, but in addition to that, we have very thick musculature, three layers of muscle. You may not be able to see it here, but we have, it's a circular, longitudinal circular. So CLC. And then we have an outer adventitia, which is kind of like a serosa. So the function of this, of this structure is to provide contractions that help expel the sperm during ejaculation. All right, and this is kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Here is the, here are the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. These are all these microvilli. What you're looking at in here, these are just all sperm. This is the, also the view of the vas deferens kind of a smaller magnification, but that's the epithelium. And here we've got actually three layers of muscle. We've got an inner longitudinal, actually my bad, it's not CLC, it's LCL. Inner longitudinal, middle circular, outer longitudinal. All right. So while we're talking about the vas deferens, I just wanted to briefly mention a procedure that um, affects the, the vas deferens, and that's the vasectomy. Um, this is kind of a very quick and dirty way showing what happens. This is a before view. This is an after view. Hold on one second. All right, and um, this is some, some, a different type of procedure, but um, what's, why is this type of procedure done? So this type of procedure results in a, in the testes, they can still make the sperm, but it just can't be transported. And eventually it's just reabsorbed. So it can be a permanent form of, first, of birth control, um, but there are some cases where people have a vasectomy and they realize, I don't want it anymore. So there are some cases where it can be reversible. All right. Um, now let's talk a bit about the accessory glands, right? So we've spoken a bit, uh, already, we've spoken about the testes, which would be out here. We've spoken about the epididymis, vas deferens, there's the vas deferens. Now we're gonna encounter these structures, the accessory glands, and there's three main. So what we have in these tubes up here are sperm. 
By the time we're done with the accessory glands, it'll now be, be known as semen. Um, and the components of the semen are produced by the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the bulb of urethral. So let's talk about those three organs. First of all, the seminal vesicles. So this is the urinary bladder. As you can see, very muscular organ. We've already learned quite a bit about that. Um, these are the seminal vesicles. The, most of the volume of semen that's produced is produced by those, uh, the, those glands. Even though it's not the largest gland, the prostate is the largest, the greatest volume is produced by the seminal vesicles. So what do the seminal vesicles produce? They produce fructose, which is an energy substrate for the sperm, which helps with their motility. Um, prostaglandins and other substances are also produced to help with motility. So nourishment, motility, and also other substances that suppress the immune system, um, which will protect any sort of immune response against the semen. <clears throat> All right, so that's the seminal vesicle. What about the prostate gland? So the prostate gland is right here. And um, uh, if you take a look, of course, this is the urethra. And if you also remember from when we're talking about the urinary system, remember we spoke about the internal urethral sphincter, the external urethral sphincter. Well, the location of the prostate is kind of a, it can be a problematic one, as you may have heard. Um, as men get older, some uh, more often than others, that this uh, prostate will enlarge and will actually can compress the urethra <clears throat> and affect urination. Um, it consists of a lot of like these little tubular glands. Um, it secretes about 20% of the volume of the semen. What does it produce? And more substances that will enhance the sperm motility. So we want to keep that up. Obviously, that's important. So when the sperm reach the vagina, they, they're able to fertilize. Um, there's enzymes that can clot and liquefy semen. And also, an, it makes the semen very alkaline. And this is really important because the pH of vagina is very acidic. And if the sperm went in basically without having this alkaline buffer, they would all die. Now, most of them die anyway, but they would all die without this basic pH. So it helps to kind of buffer them against the damaging effects of the, uh, of the acidic conditions of the vagina. All right, uh, let's talk about prostate disease. So, a couple different types of prostate conditions, some of you may have heard of them. One is called BPH, or benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, <clears throat> it can actually, sometimes also called benign prostatic hypertrophy, which is non-malignant. Um, this is where the prostate grows. And like I mentioned, this can occur in males as they get older. Um, it's non-malignant, but it can be very problematic. It affects urinary storage and voiding problems, or micturition. As you can see, here's the urethra under normal, with a more normal prostate. Here's the urethra with an enlarged prostate. You can imagine there could be problems. Um, the incidence of BPH is much greater as men get older. Um, and men that do have this, there's a variety of different um, treatments, one can be um, with medication, sometimes surgically is, is the other route, um, but that's one condition that can affect um, the prostate. The other one, much more serious, is prostate cancer. Um, <clears throat> and the incidence of prostate cancer in males is very similar to the incidence in, that it is, in, that in, incidence of breast cancer in females. It's like one in, depending on what literature you read, you read one in every eight, one in every nine people. Um, it's the most common cause of death from cancer in men over 75. So this is different from BPH. BPH is non-malignant. 
prostate cancer, of course, just by the name, cancer is malignant in the sense that it will spread. Finally, we have the bulbo urethral gland, which in the literature you might also have it known as, see it known as Cowper's gland. Cowper's gland, it's a very small gland um, located in front of the prostate. Here's the rest of the urethra, very small. Um, it produces more of a mucousy lubricating material that um, helps to facilitate the transport of sperm out of the body. All right, well, it looks like we are gonna get through this lecture okay, which is great. Um, all right, so let's take a look at where we've been and where we're going. So we spoke about the testes, all the seminiferous tubules, all the cells that are found there, um, Leydig cells, Sertoli cells, spermatogenesis occurs. Here's the epididymis where you have maturity, uh, motility occur, uh, occurs, and then the sperm are stored here. Once the ejaculation occurs, sperm are transported through what's called this ductus or vas deferens, which brings them into the pelvic cavity where they encounter the seminal vesicles behind the bladder, which then adds most of the, the fluid. The sperm, one thing I didn't mention, the sperm then travel from this area right here where the seminal, seminal vesicles are this region between the seminal vesicles and the prostate is known as the ejaculatory duct. There's the prostate. There's the bulbourethral glands. Okay, so now let's take a look at the penis. So there's a couple main structures to mention. There's the shaft. There's the glands, which is this area. And then there's this area right here, which is only present in non-circumcised males, and that's the foreskin or the prepus. So if histologically, if someone were to do a cross-section through, this is what they would see. Um, it's kind of humorous, actually. It kind of looks like a face, right? Two eyes and a mouth. Um, once you see that, you'll never look at it the same way again. But anyway, okay. Um, so what do we see here? We see um, two main features. Number one, these two structures, which are known as the corpora cavernosa. These are erectile bodies, corpora cavernosa. They're erectile bodies because in this case, they fill up with blood during erection. There's the arteries. The, this is normally just a lot of space, but it fills up with blood during erection. This is another bit of tissue. This is the corpus spongiosum, which surrounds, this is the urethra. Sometimes called the spongy urethra, but it's also known as the penile urethra. Um, this does not fill up with blood. Only this one does, this, these two. All right. So. Now we're kind of at the, almost the end of the story, at least th this half of it. Um, so if we take a look at, at the whole response, we, we, uh, male sexual response, going from, obviously we spoke about forming sperm. Um, now we're gonna talk about how sperm leaves the body. And this is under autonomic control. Remember I mentioned that the autonomic nervous system, um, the nerves are part of that spermatic cord. Well, here we involve both the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems in the sexual response. It's the three E's, erection, emission, ejaculation. Erection occurs, depends upon dilation of the arterioles, which are going to lead to engorgement of blood in here. This is under parasympathetic control. So parasympathetic control, Parasympathetic system causes vasodilation of these arteries. 
leading to engorgement of blood, right? The next step, and these two are kind of one right after the other, really, emission and ejaculation. This emission involves contraction of the vas deferens, which, of course, as we know, that helps to push the sperm out. This is under sympathetic control. And as that continues, we also see further expulsion out of the urethra, also under sympathetic control. So this is one interesting scenario where normally we talk about the autonomic nervous system, the two branches having antagonistic effects. Um, in this case, they have complementary effects, right? Before emission and ejaculation, you've got to have the erection. All right. So what is involved in this process? And, and what, what is it that, uh, um, what are some of the details of it? So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what goes into causing the erection. I already mentioned that it's autonomic stimulation, which leads to vasodilation of the arteries, which leads to increased blood flow into the cavernosum. Right? Um, so, hold on one second. So I assume you guys can still hear me. Um, if you can't, definitely let me know. Just the printer is going. Um, so there's an increased blood flow into the cavernosum. And what, so that's fine. But what also is interesting is what happens is there's also a compression of the outgoing veins. So let, let me just reiterate that because. So first, we, this is the normal condition right here. And here we've got the erectile tissue. Here we've got the artery. So we're going back here for a second. So we're looking at right arteries. Arteries here. And if you take a look at some of the veins out there. Arteries here. Veins out there. Okay. So as the blood comes in, and fills up this area inside, you can see it, it's gone from a flaccid to a erect state. It also causes a outward compression of the veins. It might be hard to see here, but these outside veins are flattened. So not only do we have the blood coming in, but the blood can't leave. So that, that helps to maintain the erectile state. All right. Um, Last thing I want to talk about, I think, yes, is a little bit about the urethra. So we've really spoken about all the different organs, right? From the testes all the way on, epididymis all the way on. Well, of course, this tube that's leaving is the urethra. And I just wanted to mention there's really three main parts to the urethra. All right. We have this part, which goes through the prostate. This is called the prostatic urethra. It's the same organ, it's same structure, it just called different things in different regions. As we leave the prostatic urethra, we then enter into this area, which is called the intermediate urethra. Some books also call it the membranous urethra. And from the membranous urethra, everything, the um, material then goes from the membranous out through what's called the spongy urethra. Now, I'm going to mention a couple names to you. Um, I didn't write them down, but I will tell them to you. Prostatic urethra is always called prostatic urethra. Intermediate urethra is sometimes called membranous. So if you see that somewhere. Spongy urethra is sometimes called penile. Okay? So those are just a couple steps, a couple different parts of the urethra. All right. So let me go ahead and stop the share. 
All right. All right, so um, we're gonna stop right there. Those of you guys that came in a little bit late, just to go back for a second, um, this is what, so today we did get through reproductive. Um, that means next Monday we won't be doing this. We'll just be doing reproductive two. Um, and then Wednesday, if we didn't finish reproductive two, female, we'll do it on Wednesday. And then you can see everything throughout. So uh, at this point, does anybody have any questions? Will you update the third uh, lecture? The, the, yes. You mean the next reproductive yes. one? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's actually two lectures, but one's a little bit larger. Yes. I, so I will be updating that probably sometime later today or tomorrow. Okay. Because oh, I, cause I copied that before the lecture. Oh, I'll make, yeah, I'll make, yeah, I, I typically do that a few days before the lecture, so, you, so, or at least the day before, so, so in other words, don't, don't, um, I mean, you can certainly look at it and get information, but the final version of it probably won't be up for another, like, couple days. Okay, and the study guide will be up, too, probably, this weekend, or? Study guide, well, let's see, our exam is on Wednesday. Yes, yeah, sometime over the weekend. I'm not sure, but yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? That's it, I think. All right. Well, everyone have a good day. Thank and you. I will see you. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Otherwise, I'll see you on Monday.